folks, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all here tonight. You're all very brave coming out in this social distancing atmosphere. What I might do, I've got 40 minutes. I'll bring you through the presentation deck for about 15 minutes. I'll try and get to the HVivo piece as quick as I can, because that's the thing everyone wants to know about virology. But what I'd like to do the last, I'll talk about our company for 10 or 15 minutes, but I was in a lucky position in the last couple of weeks. Um, our country is probably one of the best experts. John Oxford works with us now. We've brought him back this last month. Professor John Oxford. He's probably one of the most renowned experts on SARS, Mars, coronavirus. And I spent the last two, three weeks when he comes into the office. He presented to all our staff yesterday for an hour. And I was kicking myself, please should have switched the phone on. I want to give this to everybody. So he's going to do a little video in a week's time. But I learned more in that hour, as did the staff, that everyone our friends, family, relations wants to know about coronavirus. So I'm going to hijack it. I'm going to give you a five minute summary of what John said. But he's quite, he's 77. This is his book he published 15 years ago. Republishes every three or four years ago. This is his latest republication by John Oxford, or Professor Oxford, he likes me called. And he said, guess what's in his front cover two years ago? What's that? Coronavirus. Even more importantly, this one. It's the Wahoon coronavirus. And on page 137, he says, this, and he keeps calling him this little friend, this little friend we need to watch out. The Wahoon coronavirus is in the animal kingdom. Someday it might jump and we've no immunity. Isn't that quite prophetic from two years ago? <laughs> anyway, let me come back to that. And look, genuinely, He's quite optimistic. We shouldn't worry, and I'll come to that, man, because there is actually a, there's a bit of optimism. This is the world is not over. This is not, look, they're called a pandemic. But by the way, did anybody know H1N1, the swine flu panic in 2009? It was a pandemic. And who here remembers the swine flu 2009? Well, kind of, yeah. But what do we know about 2009, more importantly? What about Lehman's? What about the financial crash? We all remember that. But the 2009 pandemic this evening, uh, it's been declared a pandemic, but it was actually, believe it or not, a more dangerous pandemic. It had a massively higher mortality rate than what we're dealing with. But let me come to that. I'm here to talk about open orphans, so let me take it through quickly, and I'll share a little bit of John Oxford's wisdom. Um, look, open orphan was set up by myself, uh, and how do we do this? Uh, that's me, and my colleague, Brenton Buckley. We kind of like professors, Brenton, Professor Buckley as well. We, prior to this, four years ago, five years ago, we set up this company here, Amrit Pharma, and Brenton helped me put it together. And that was basically a little busted oil and gas company I had some dealings with, had a market cap of five million. We reversed in some pharma assets, and today, well, Amrit got hit by 20% drop this week, but previous week had a market cap of 200 million. So we got it from a tiny little busted oil and gas company, we rolled up our sleeves, and that's where me as a financer, the only thing I knew about drugs was this company, and Brenton helped me. Anyway. Brenton took early retirement two years ago. He says, Carl, get out of Amrit. That's drugs, high risk, high rewards. Let's set up a services company to service pharmaceutical companies. We'll grow it quickly and we'll have a bit of fun. He's, I know what to buy. And maybe our friends, Icon, will buy it of us. So look, it's an opportunist play, Open Orphan. And we've some quite good people in here as well. Uh, but by the way, management team, microscopic. I don't like management teams that cost money. At these small companies, should be kept small, okay? Moving swiftly on, what have we? So the aim was to buy two companies. Look, we smash out too many management team. They're both loss making. We bought in June, then Life Science. Lovely little company, ridiculous organization structure. We fired a third of the staff and guess what? Revenues goes up. Almost similar, we took over HVivo in January. It was the fastest takeover in AIM in seven and a half years, one public company. You know. And again, it's almost exact same we found here. A deeply expensive management team, bureaucratic structure. Now the management team had taken 11 million of costs out. Not enough. My colleague Leo here is busy ripping out a few more costs, okay? And look, we were good at taking out costs. Most in rooms say, right, Kyle, finance is easy ripping out costs. What about getting revenue up? We'll come to that in a minute. We have announced last week, one deal last Friday, that's almost more than the revenue for the whole of HVivo last year. HVivo last year is guiding the market. Allegedly, they'll do about 14 million. We announced one deal last Friday that's 3.2 million up front. 
there's a 7 million follow on then in the summer, and in reality, that's 11, it's actually 10 million. So it's about a 13 million deal. That's not bad. And we're only in month three. So, look, what we're doing, we're providing services to pharma companies. So, putting the two together, HV I'll talk lots about because it's here, based in East London, in East London. It's a world leader, small niche, but it's nice being a world leader in testing vaccines, testing antivirals, and then you can do respiratory. Six months ago and three months ago, we were started taking over this company. People, what the hell's antivirals? Don't know. What the hell's vaccine? And it's kind of, being frank, we got kind of lucky. But it was a Cinderella company. Nobody wanted to know about it. We picked it up because it was desperately cheap. Uh, life took an inevitable direction. And we're really lucky. HVivo is now very actively trying to help find solutions to the current problem. Come back to that. But look, so basically what we have, we've got this little company, this little company. This is East London based, everything all in Whitechapel. Uh, two offices, one in Queen Mary's Hospital where the lab is, and a low cost rented office around the corner in 150 minorities. We've ripped out the management costs. Our plan is very quickly to have the both of them profitable before month four, five, because both of them are loss making. And how do you make them profitable? Rip out loads of costs, but you've got to increase revenue. We've done the costs and revenues are now coming through. What else have we got? We've got a genomic data platform and that takes a long time to build up. But guess what? HVivo has 20 years of data. We've got genomic data, DNA data, bloods data. So by acquiring HVivo, we've got our genomic database almost done. Okay. Um, and then this one's interesting. We've called this as our lottery ticket, Immutex. HVivo raised 113 million, and I'll show you they spent it wisely, not, because we bought it for 13, five years after they raised the money, like, so what you waste. But they did spend a lot of money here. Last year and the previous year, they couldn't give this thing away. This thing, the joint venture has the world's first phase three ready universal flu vaccine, a vaccine that does once in a lifetime, once every 10 years, Every known. <clears throat> Two years ago, people said, what do you want that for? The current flu jab works. Now, that's the time this is coming in. Now, we're ascribing no value to this because we've tried to out-license this universal flu vaccine two years ago. There was no interest. We've acquired it for a nominal interest. I think over the coming months, I keep calling this our lottery ticket. And bear in mind, lottery tickets, they're worth very little till it comes in. So like, don't, we're still ascribing, this is high risk, high reward. And that's not the business we're in. There's no money going into advance in this. This will be out license. All the money, these have to be profitable and the throw off cash. So there's no more wasting money in R&D, developing drugs. But we do have, we're really lucky we've got two drugs over here that could be interesting. And one of them is a flu V, phase three ready, universal uh, influenza vaccine, which is kind of interesting to have in the current climate. What else? Look, putting these two companies together, why does it work? Uh, HVivo's revenue model is very lumpy. Contracts are three to five million and two to three years. Open orphans are half a million to seven million, much broader. And we last from one to eight years. Put the two together and the average contract gets transformed. The average contract goes now up to 10 to 20 million. And we've proven that last week. Our first contract now 3.2 up front, almost certainly of a seven, we're saying it's probably 10. So that's a 30 million contract. So it's just the synergy of putting together this little company doing that, this little company doing that, put the two together and you're doing a package. Does that make sense? Open Orphan, basically we only IPO'd in June 19. Um, we basically acquired service company then. And, but the beauty about it, rather than do it from scratch, We've got beautiful customers. Janssen, second biggest pharma company in Germany, born in England. Then Open Orphan provide all PK analysis. PK is pharmacokinetics to this company for three years. A company with 30,000 staff, three of the most important staff are our staff, and we've got a three year rolling contract for them. Galapagos, Farming, Servier, one of the biggest French companies, one of the biggest French companies. So you acquire these little struggling companies for the square root of nothing. It would take us 10 years to acquire these by the company and they have the relationships. So look, that's what Open Orphan was doing with the genomic database. Look, it will scale on. It's coming together. 
we're basically collecting genomic data, sharing it with pharma companies, and doing a profit share with the patient advocacy groups. The beauty with this, we can now fill the genomic database with the data we've got from HVivo. And again, it's just sometimes an acquisition works. HVivo, this is what I want to spend most of my time on because this is a really interesting piece. Bear in mind, this company couldn't give it away last year. <laughs> Nobody wanted it. Uh, it was literally Cinderella. Uh, founded in 1989 by our friend John Oxford. He spun out of the Queen Mary's Hospital. AIM listed in 2012. The previous management team raised not alone 100, if you do the sums, they reduced it. That's 113 million. We acquired it for 13 and it came with 2 million cash. That's pretty ridiculous. But it did spend, we got some of their cash. It built Europe's only, the world's only 24 bed quarantine clinic. That's how I spent most days this week and last week in this place. This, it's part of Queen Mary's Hospital. You've 24 of these rooms and we basically, it's 24, in the, each room cost a million pounds to build. Everything is isolated. So we can bring patients in and test them. But let me tell you what else. They spent about 10 million building Europe's best virology laboratory on site. So that's 25, 10, 35 million, which we got our hands on. Now it's, it's a leasehold, so it's not freehold, but it's a quite a nice lease. We can keep renewing and the lease is not too big. They also spent this, the lawyers allowed us to put a figure on this. They spent 25 million developing a portfolio of eight challenge study models. They've got two flus, two RSVs. RSV is rhino something, 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 but it's mean, I call it the runny nose. Anything with runny nose, you've got a rhino RSV virus. For us adults, totally harmless. I probably have a RSV virus today, I've got a sniffy nose, don't worry, I haven't But for children, it kills them. Infants, RSV is deadly. So there's a huge interest in developing vaccines for that. So that's why we're challenged. But one HRV, one asthma, one cough, one sleep. That's eight of them. What are challenge study models? That's people like, Three months ago, I said, well, what are I had to Google, what are they? Challenge study models are the company takes the wild version of the virus, okay? It's called the wild version. They take it in from the wild. We tame it, it's like a wild horse. We train it. We take out the nasty bits, take away the tail, the stings. And at the moment, the reason we're in the, a lot of the papers this week, we announced we're taking a wild version of COVID-19. We're going to get a similar version called OC43 and 43 being the year it was discovered, and it's a coronavirus. Make it as close to the real thing, and that's a challenge study model. That's ours, we own it. So then, if a big vaccine company wants to test a new vaccine against the coronavirus, we can get them patients, volunteers, we put them into our clinic, we infect, uh, we inoculate them with the vaccine, half of them get the vaccine, the new, this is happening over the coming months, Half of them will get whatever the new now. Do you want to test the vaccines worse getting COVID? You cannot put COVID-19 in it because it kills people. That would be, that have it stopped about 100 years ago. So you can't put it. But we will put the closest we can get, which is going to be a coronavirus we have. We put it in, so we basically vaccinate everybody. 12 people get the vaccine. 12 people have a placebo in this place here, in Whitechapel. We wait three weeks, send them home, and they've been vaccinated but the half doesn't know who's got the real vaccine and the other half don't know. We bring them in, settle them in, make them comfortable. They're locked away for 10 days. They're not allowed to leave that room for 10 days uh, or two weeks, but you've unlimited Sky TV, unlimited Game Boys, Netflix, your mobile phone, your iPad, everything. It's got all, it's got an ensuite shower and toilet. It's like, look, most people love it. We paid three and a half thousand pounds. We, we had 10,000 students signed up this week for the, for the, for 10,000, the system almost broke. It's queuing up. However, most people who signed up this week want to help, as everyone wants to help. But basically, challenge study models is what I did. So basically then, then we challenge the immune system. We infect them with a version of the virus that's pretty close to the real thing. If we're testing them for flu, we'll give them a flu challenge model. If we're testing for RSV, we'll give them RSV. So there's 24 people in, half of them have the real vaccine, half of them have placebo. We'll hit them all with our version of virus. And over 10 days we can watch, does the vaccine work? There's 12 people have no vaccine, there's 12 people can vaccinate. And the patient walk out, walks out after day 10 or day 14. So we know, does it work or does it not? It's a really, really fast way of testing a vaccine. So I'm dwelling on that, that's what this is. 
little company in East London is the world leader as a leading performer of, of Chinese study models. And all we announced on Monday to the world, and we've been damaged, camera crews were every in the world, we keep them away, we're not allowed to bring them in. The Daily Mirror and Express got in yesterday, so there might be some stuff in the Daily Mirror and Express tomorrow on it. The Sunday Times had it that we're now developing a version of COVID-19. It's called OC43. It's harmless. The worst you'll get is a runny nose, a bit of a sore head. So we won't own the vaccines, but vaccine companies around the world can now come to East London over the summer. Does it work? You have two weeks to find out. Does, everybody, does that make sense? Because Chinese studies have been trying to explain to journalists ask you, what is a challenge study? So it's basically a challenge study model is our version of the virus. We also test antivirals. Uh, an antiviral is, we do the exact same process. An antiviral is, if anybody's in the hospital in the next week or two, and we, and we any of us, we'll talk about that, if we potentially have the virus, there's no good giving you a vaccine, it's too late. So what do we give? You get an antiviral. During 2009, it was Tamiflu. It was developed for something completely different, Roche product, Tamiflu worked. So over the summer, we'll have people coming in, uh, big pharma companies saying, look, We've got this antiviral, we want to know does work. So we do, we'll get 24 patients. This time is slightly different. What we do, we don't vaccinate them in advance because this now is too late to vaccinate them. We bring them in day one, we get them comfortable. There's your bed, there's your Sky Sports, there's your Game Boy, do what you want. And after three days, uh, we will infect them, all of them this time. All 24 will get uh, our virus. It'll be a, a mild version of coronavirus and we'll wait till they get sick runny nose sore head and they sign up for this there's a link to the website you want to see but it's not doing a very mild version and then day four we'll administer the antivirals half of them will get the antivirals and half of them will get a sugar pill or placebo day 10 we'll know does the antiviral work or does it not because half of these patients are getting sugar or placebo so that's the way you test antivirals you infect them all 50 percent gets the vaccine the antivirals so look it's a really simple business model Nobody had an interest in it up to three months ago. And we, we only acquired it because it was cheap. Um, so that's kind of what we got. Um, putting them together is really interesting. Blue is what Venn Open Orphan, like basically Open Orphan was only put together a year ago. We acquired Venn's been around. So the blue is Venn Open Orphan. It's a CMC phase one. Challenge studies, that's what our friends in East London, HVivo, do. The beauty of a challenge study is that when it gets done, you need to do phase one before it. You need to do CMC. So the deal we announced on Friday of last week, we said we're doing a challenge study. It's, it's literally started this week. But we're also doing CMC. We're also doing data management and we're doing medical writing. So this is the first time we put the combination. People, I'd be honest, I didn't think we'd do it that quick. So we're able to provide both half of the company on a lovely 13 million deal. So that's the benefit of this cross-selling. Most people who met me early in the year said, oh, God, if you could cross selling done in six months, you'd be lucky. Six weeks, we've signed our first cross selling deal. This was a challenge, literally talking about challenge. When we did this in the roadshow, H Vivo presented this list of clients in with 81 million. And people, oh, come on, guys, you've never done more than 15 million in your life. You're smoking dope. The only interesting part is it kind of surprised ourselves. We've now got one contract that is minimum three on a good day, it's 13. And the do, we've already got that. Some of you in the room, I said, uh, we should have done it in February. Okay, we, we missed it by seven days. And our plan was to try and do one of these every month for the first few months. So we might announce two in March. We'll wait and see, we can't say. But the plan would be the crack in the whip. My view is if this was presented to us by HVivo, and if there was a remote sniffle of the truth in it, they should be banging out one deal every month. So hopefully, we've done our first time. It should have been done in February. It was a week late, uh, but hopefully we might have a second one in March and another one in April. Because if we don't deliver revenue, then we're not doing our job. Look, that's there's no website. We've taken a lot of costs. I thought I did a good job of taking 3.85 million out last year on the annual overhead. Our friends in HVivo did take 11 million, but Leo will tell you there's more to be taken out of this company. Um, revenue growth, uh, position profitability. Anybody's interested in our flu stuff, this is the assets. And I'm really keen, we're not a drug discovery company. We're, look, any funding for this will be out licensed third party. Our job is to make sure Open Orphan starts making profits the next two or three months. And we have a nice profitable company.
we're a services company. Does that make sense? Uh, and then we just happen to have our wonderful previous management team kind of left these lottery tickets. But bear in mind, 18 months ago, nobody would touch these assets. There is a report came out yesterday morning that they work in one of the medical journals. So we're sort of, we're, we published that because we have some Chinese people around now showing interest. So 18 months, Chinese pharma companies had no interest in vaccines, but they're kind of got interested now. So the reason we talk a bit about this, but please, anybody who's a shareholder, potential shareholders, treat that last page and it's deliberately the last page as a lottery ticket. How you value our company is, can we make it profitable? Can we grow sales? And if we have a nice profitable company by mid-summer, we've got something, okay? Now what I'd love to do is share a bit of information, okay? I sat through, because like, we're in a virology company and now we're testing vaccines and doing all this exciting stuff. Um, we tell the staff we're doing. Leo sent an email to everybody in our Dutch office yesterday to work from home for the next three weeks. The beauty of a small services company, doesn't matter, they love working from home. But that was because the coronavirus is around the Breda area, which is in our east of Amsterdam. Uh, but it, the, believe it or not, business is going on fine. It's the, the, the people say, oh, work from home, what happens? We probably will do more revenue this month than last month. People are at home, they're not messing about and commuting in. But back to COVID, I only dwell five minutes on this thing. Just this is a brain dump from John Oxford telling their staff yesterday. And look, getting under the skin this last month. This guy was kind of banished from the company by the former management team, even though he's a genius. We don't like him. And I met him at Christmas. He's crusty old bollocks, but I quite like him. He, like, he knows us. So his view, what we all should do is, look, let's accept where we are. COVID-19 is like a bus. It's coming across Europe and it's coming. But the bus is not going to kill us. Uh, the most important bit, and this is only learned this in the last two days, I want to share it. Why generally influenza and all these other airborne, uh, mainly influenza, why does it disappear in spring and summertime and comes back again in the winter? And then funny enough, it turns up in Australia and New Zealand in their winter and it lives in the summer. Any of you ever think about that? Think about it. Why does it go away? Why does the flu disappear? Gen no, there's... there's as a general rule, it, look, it, it subsides. You don't hear many people lying in bed at Easter and, oh, got the flu. But you hear a lot of them in November, December. The reason is influenza is in the air all the time. It never goes away. It never ends up going down to Australia, getting the bus and off to Australia. Influenza and COVID and coronaviruses are around all the time. And, but what happens is it's airborne. It's in your mouth. It's microscopic. It's called microscopic respiratory droplets. When I breathe, whew, Leo's got a few of my breath. They'll hit them going that way. In the winter, doors are closed, windows are closed. We're in the house. Uh, we're in buses, we're in transport. In the summer and spring, windows open. And at the moment, we've got detectors back in the lab. What's the viral load? And we have a thing, it'd be stuck in the air. And we can say, what's the viral load in this room at the moment? Because there's loads of viruses floating. It's not like there's loads of virus in this room now. But come summertime, the air conditioning is pumping more outside air, but particularly in your normal house, windows are open, we're walking more. So John Oxford saying, I know he, he's been careful going public because the government will kill him for saying this. The most important thing, everybody must wash their hands. That's 50% of our, you must wash it. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. First time in life, do it. literally 20 seconds. It's so important. Take your watch off, throw the watches away because the watch is catching, okay? I've lost my watch the last two weeks, got rid of it. It's in my bag somewhere. Wash your hands for 20 seconds. That's critically, stop shaking hands. It's a terrible thing. And when he started last, elbow. And why is the elbow? Leo will get up there. This, this is really important because this is like the government, government will tell you this thing. When I shake hands with Leo, my mouth and his mouth, the hands force you to align. And when I breathe out, there's a vortex of air. It hits him right in the face and it goes down his throat. If I do this, hiya Leo. This is the thing, elbow bone. My air is going that way and he's going that way. So this I only learned this last week. Stop shaking hands. It's genuine. He says, look, we've statistics. 50% of flu is through handshakes. Our health minister, what happened? What was she doing? And she's got grown. So that's the easiest way. And, and actually also, uh, we got statistics yesterday in the, in the 1918 Spanish flu. The most important statistics was the British army had people in nissen huts. And they realized when the beds were six inches apart, nine inches apart, they moved them, and there's a doctor came in 19, and the biggest thing was, when beds were three feet apart, there was only a 50% infection, cross infections. So it's, uh, the, 
be frank, it's called social distancing. So unfortunately, <laughs> for the next two, three months, stop shaking hands, get in the I only started this week, and you suddenly go, oh, sorry, can't. It will reduce, constantly wash your hands, get rid of the watches. But the good news on this is that, look, it's coming. It's, it's unfortunate circulation, but spring is reducing it massively. We're not going to have a northern Italy. I was supposed to go skiing in northern Italy. And in the video, northern Italy, and I'm not supposed to, you're not supposed to rub your eyes and stuff. You can't do it. You should, you should do it with that. The thing is, viruses stick to, they, they, don't, they don't like soft surfaces. So you should do, you shouldn't do that, okay? But anyway, why is it bad in northern Italy? Indoors, Milan's like wet, cold, hot, steamy. Go down, warmer, middle Italy, further down. Yes, a bit, there's exceptions. But people are outdoor walking around, the viral load in the atmosphere. So anyway, long story short, this is only my sharing this, and hopefully there'll be more in the media. We should relax. Spring is, if, if this happened in September, October, November, yeah, it'd be a pain in the ass. It's happening now, and the view is, it will, no, the government will kill us for saying this, you have to take protections, you've got to wash your hands, there should be social distance, you should walk as much. I won't get in the lift, because you're in the lift, there's too many people around, so I've started walking up, and again, John Oxford, all the things you think with the viral load. So the good weather will help us, okay? And what's that gonna allow? That's gonna allow the governments over Europe, Northern Europe to say, over the summer, to find a vaccine that works, okay? But more importantly, to find an antiviral that reduces the symptoms. Now, the really good news about Corona, it's been around for 50 years, 60 years. People know it very well. It doesn't mutate. The flu mutates every three or four hours. Corona doesn't mutate. So there's not gonna be this weird species. It came out of an animal. It's very predictable. Um, the other thing we've learned the last couple of days about, so it's coming, just get with it. The wonderful news, it doesn't touch kids. They're immune to it. There's, there's the odd one, but kids under 15, they're immune to it. The influenza goes at them hard. And infants, it kills them. There hasn't been a single infant that's got it. So that's good. So we don't worry about the kids under 16. It doesn't attack most healthy adults, okay? It has been very bad to our grandparents. If you have 75, be careful. Be really careful. It has been cruel on the more elderly. Why are the governments really worried? Most of us, there's no signs of it. Guarantee that some of us have it. Influenza, if you ever get it, the flu, you know about 80% sore back, sore arm. 80% of COVID, no symptoms. You'll never know about it. 90%. The few people get it, there's a small, and this is where the governments are really worried and why Italy cried panic. And John Oxford told me this three weeks ago. He's this small, small percentage of people get it really bad and you have trouble breathing. So you've got to get into the hospital. It doesn't matter what age, you could be 18 or 60. You need to go into hospital and what you need is oxygen and you need intensive care. And that's happening, what they're saying, the Italian hospitals are overrun, but they're not. Go and look at them. They're overrun by people needing ICU and intensive. There's not hundreds of thousands. So what the governments are afraid, Bart's around the corner from us, has only three intensive care rooms and 10 ventilators. It's the ventilators you need a bit. And look, it's, if you can get the hospital, the small percentage you need, they need oxygen, they need ventilation. ICU. So that's where the government's away. So look, what I'm trying to say, this is not a case of people dying in the streets. Like the papers are going, you'd love to strangle someone when you read it. And there's only I'm reading it and listening to it. So what I'm saying, not talking kids, it's coming. Good weather is almost guaranteed we won't have an ordinary day because they're in the middle of damp, soggy wet. Imagine that. And, and Anyway, I've said enough. Is that my speech in COVID-19? It's, it's, it's a good attempt at avoiding questions, but they're coming. Yeah, no, we'll go questions. Coming. We've got 10 they're minutes, coming. guys. Questions. Would you use the tube at this time of... Uh... Um, look, it's a fact that we've got to use it. I've used it the day twice, okay? But I didn't use the... I, 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 there's a used desk, the L lift. You, you, you can't change your life. Um, I would minimise the tube, okay? If I can walk. Uh, I like walking. So I'm only going with John Oxford. And then asking a few more people. We've got like 120 staff. We've got 37 virologists with PhDs. Our chief scientist has a DPhil or DocPhil from Oxford in, guess what? Virus, influenza virus replication. <laughs> How do you do that? So yeah, ask them all. Yeah, look, we've, life has got to go on. Look, a lot of us will catch it. The vast majority will never know we had it. I've got probably an RSV, Sniffy nose, we call it RSV. If I was a, an infant, that would make me very sick. It's just a runny nose. I call RSV's runny, or runny nose. So what I'm trying to say is, 
genuinely, yeah, you, look, I would say minimize the tube. John Oxford said yesterday, he came into the office, he's sorry guys, I came in late. I took the off-peak tube. And he says as well, it's the most dangerous is when somebody, it doesn't travel, he says, within three feet. So if you're on the tube and it's full, if somebody's coughing, can you just move, uh, cough that way? And it's, bear in mind, it's this called the, the vortex of air coming out. When I'm breathing now, it's this space here, and then it disperses. Any other questions? Uh, you talked uh, just briefly on the genomic database. Yes. Uh, is that commercially ready yet, or is it still no. under End of the summer. Uh, no, it's, the database is built, good to go. We have data coming into it, but the biggest data load will be coming from HVIVO. They have 20 years of data. Again, it's, 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 it's crime. Like Leo knows me. I scream at people, and I'm not too many, whatever. but this data is just sitting there. They're not using it. You say, oh, I'm kind of busy. There's a lot of these small cap aim listed companies. There's no accountability. Data is just stacking up there. Oh, yeah, tomorrow. So we're using it. But from the, from the original intention, that's uh, really going to be complete the end of the summer, did you say? No, over the summer. Data is uploading as we speak. Hi, Mr. Farrell. Hmm. Um, so there seem to be a few really speculative, speculative elements to the valuation of this company. For instance, you have the data set, which clearly is really valuable. Mm -hmm. You have what you call as the lottery ticket, which is clearly potentially mm -hmm. very valuable. But let's say me as a shareholder, mm -hmm. I strip all of these elements back and I go back to your previous presentations. Mm -hmm. You stated a 20% net income, you know, uh, you know, version of the world in the future. Uh, so, so let's say we have a 30, 30 million market cap now. Mm -hmm. If we apply a 20% margin to that and we ignore any growth, mm -hmm. we're saying that it's 15 million revenue. So let's plonk on some growth there. Let me tell you it's public, okay? We've said this part, revenue last year. Uh, HVivo was, two of us combined at 28 million. That's yeah. kind of reasonably public. That's not inside the reasonably public. We got, we got it. The combined entity, we've said, it, almost hit 30 million pounds last year, the two companies together. But all of this rides on the net income being positive. So mm -hmm. are you saying that by the six month period, would your audited account state a positive profit after tax? Uh, our interim accounts, which we published. I know you can't confirm that at the moment. Yeah, yeah. no, no, and we can't look. Well, no, the best way, let me tell you how you'd value this company, okay? Um, there's something badly wrong if we don't hit about 30 million revenues this year. I'll fire a lot of people. So we, look, we did nearly 30 million last year. Yeah. We've now announced a deal that should drop 10 million at least. This slide here, let me see, sorry, this slide's really important. Uh, look at this. The, and this is the, how you put these two pieces together. Open Orphan, 10.5 million in confirmed backlog. That's, back, that's yeah. order signed last year, we've got to deliver. So that's 10.5 million revenue we will put in the bank this year, okay? Yeah, and then there's another four million in advance. So at the end of Q1, the van side of the business, we've got 14 million in revenues that will be in the bank in the first half of the year. Yeah. Separately, HVIVO, we did say, look, we make, they said they guided the market to be 14.5 million last year. They kind of more or less did it. We'll not say exactly, but they said that. So we're saying we're gonna do 30 million this year, comfortably. So 30 million comfortably, um, every other pharma services company, every other one that's profitable, trades between two and three times revenue. Today, we trade on one times revenue for the exact point you make, we're loss making. The minute we can prove, and I said we're going to RNS it, we don't wait for the interim accounts, we will make it clear and the nomad will go bananas, God, you shouldn't have said that, you're profitable. But I'll guarantee you, the minute we're profitable, everybody will know. I'll get a slap on the wrist, we're not supposed to tell them until the interim. Once we're profitable, we should trade on two times revenue. Does that make sense? And then separately, during the roadshow, we guided the market. We we're gonna try and get an EBITDA, I'm not sure we'll get there, of between four and five million for this year. So if you take an EBITDA of four million and just put about a, even a 10X multiple to it, and that has nothing to the speculative stuff, you get a 40 million revenue or 40 million market. So I think the current market cap is about right because we're loss making. We're one times revenue. 
Uh, we have five or six million in the bank. We keep forgetting to say that because take the market cap minus the cash. We're really only going to market cap at 25 million, pull the cash out. Yeah, and you have the data as well, etc. Exactly. Does that make sense? So I think, look, the current market cap is about right. Like, we're not dirt cheap. Like, 25 million is a lot of money for a loss making company, but we do have. Leo, you were going to say something? Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, Leo Tool, I'm CFO for the group. I just wanted to share some perspective on what we're doing to, to drive the company to profitability, yeah. which I think is at the root of, of your question. Uh, and that is a net income. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, b- break even and, and beyond. So, right now, we're focusing on really cutting cost across the board within the existing open orphan and ven business already since we completed the merger we've already acted on and executed significant changes in our cost base now those cost savings will materialize over the next number of months because it effectively involves people and there's usually roll-off periods for them as you, as you would expect. Secondly, we're now, as Carl alluded to, we're now aggressively addressing the HVivo division of our business. They have already cut a lot of costs to, I suppose, clean up the, the, the prior business plan, but there's more costs that we can take out of that business. And that, that is really on top of what we were probably guiding um, prior, to, prior to the merger. So that's really driving the cost base there. The last important element is there is significant synergy that we can get across both companies. So the, one of these new um, uh, deals that we struck, that we announced in, in recent days, some of the work that you do in, f- to that deal, you know, biostatistical data management work, typically HVivo would have outsourced that work to third parties. Now the existing Venn team can do quite a bit of that work and basically mop up existing uh, free capacity within our teams. So that's another source of real great value that goes straight to the bottom line. I think we're at a good valuation. We're at one times revenue with five million in the bank. Don't put a value on the drugs. They're the lottery tickets. Don't put a value on the data. If they come good, that's a bonus. Our real value is when we turn profitable, we should go to two times revenue. That's all. Sorry. Carl, Done. Yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Okay.